I'm Chosen Architect, and this is All the Mods Volcano Block. Getting started today, oh boy, are things gonna be interesting because today we dive into the more advanced part of mechanism. Uh, we need to generate a few things. We need to generate fizzle fuel. We also need to get ourselves a fission reactor up and running. And then we need to start utilizing the byproducts that are being produced from the waste that we're gonna be generating. So that sounds like a lot, but I'm gonna try my best to break it down as best as possible. Now inside my inventory, I have a few things sort of set aside. Uh, that I'm going to need. And uh, this is going to all kind of make sense uh, here in just a moment. So some of the base ingredients that we're going to need in order to make fizzle fuel, which is what we're going to be working on first, is going to be coal, fluorite, and uranium. And we need those in abundance. So to be able to produce fizzle fuel, you need to make sure that we're gener that you're generating a bunch of those things. Now, at the moment, we're generating coal and fluorite and uranium all from sieving. And uh, I have not upgraded my sieve system just yet, but that will be in the future. Now, what we can do is we can start utilizing some of that coal and fluor uh, fluor <laughs> fluorite and uranium right now to at least get some sort of fizzle fuel up and running and potentially get a smaller fission reactor up and running. And then, of course, I plan on upscaling. So I have this area set aside and I want to start utilizing all of these materials and making all of these chemicals individually so that way we can scale up in the future. And what I want to do is use these things called quantum entangle porters. So what a quantum entangle porter is, it's basically a tank that allows you to send things wirelessly. Um, you can send power wirelessly. You can send uh, a lot of things. You can send gases, power, all of that stuff basically inside of one singular block. Uh, and as you can see right here, this is all the things that it can send. Slurries, it can send energy, heat, uh, pigments, all kinds of stuff. The main thing that I want to use this for is to basically filter. We are going to be producing each of these individual chemicals that you see right here on the, the hot bar. And I want to have a entangle porter for each one of these things. Now, of course, I'm missing a few things like hydrogen and oxygen that we're also going to need set up here, but we'll talk about that once we get those up and running. Now, of course, one of the first things we need to get set up is going to be an electrolytic separator. Um, so in order to get this going, we just need to feed it some water and it's going to create hydrogen and oxygen uh, so long as we pipe it in. So we just take a simple pipe such as the mechanical pipe and we just go ahead and say, hey, feed this in. Of course, I'm going to be feeding it power from this right here. So I'm going to go ahead and select this as the modular router power system that we've been using. And uh, yeah, without any upgrades, it's not super, super fast. So we can go ahead and get this started. It's not super fast and it does produce hydrogen and oxygen, as you can see right here. Now we have these both set to idle where this machine won't run if this is full. And that's perfectly fine for this particular setup. Uh, unless, however you need hydrogen and you don't need oxygen and then this fills up well then you will no longer be producing hydrogen either uh, because both of these have to be separating in equal parts in order for it to run pop properly so setting this to dump excess and just le letting it run is pretty darn good and then this is where we can actually use the quantum entangle porter now i do believe that uh by default this right here will the left side will output the hydrogen and uh the right side will output the oxygen and you can set this to automatically export. And that's kind of what I want to do. Um, let's go ahead and by default though, let's turn the auto export off so we can go ahead and set up the entangle porters. So this is where I want to use the entangles for these. And I think this is going to be, uh, this is going to make things so much easier because anytime we need like hydrogen or oxygen, we'll just be able to use the entangle porter and we'll be able to set a network for this. So for example, this side is the hydrogen, right? So all we have to do is create a channel for this. And there we have hydrogen and we just hit accept. And now we've created a hydrogen channel. And then same over here, we can create another channel or we could select this channel and hit set. Uh, and that's how you would send it to something else. But for right now, I'm just going to go ahead and make a new one. And this will be oxygen. So there we go. We have an oxygen channel and now we have a hydrogen channel that we can use anywhere. And so once we have this selected, by, by default, this is already set to the frequency hydrogen and this is at the frequency oxygen. We can go ahead and now set this to automatically eject. 
and that should now be sending here. And you can see that we have hydrogen going in here. I don't know if there's a way of seeing the storage outside. No, it's just through the uh, the tooltips that we're using, the uh, good old jade. And as you see, hydrogen's filling up and we have oxygen filling up. Now that is a perfect example of all the things that I'm going to be doing. Now I have broken this down into parts. So our ultimate goal is to get to fizzle fuel, uh, which you can see right here. Uranium hexafluoride is what we're going to eventually turn into fizzle fuel with an isotropic centrifuge. So in reality, it's just a bunch of machines that we're going to have to set up to produce all of these basic chemicals, right? Um, and so we need to kind of backtrack here. So fizzle fuel, ultimately, we're going to need uranium hexafluoride. To make uranium hexafluoride, we need uh, hydrofluoric acid, which just comes from fluoride or fluoride that we use sulfuric acid for. And this is like a turning point in the steps of producing this. Now we need to focus on, well, this is a, a certain point. We need to go, okay, so how do we make sulfuric acid? And so over here, I have these things sort of set up and divided up. So to actually make sulfuric acid, it's not too difficult, but you do need sulfur. To get sulfur, we need to kind of crush up, uh, we need to crush up coal. Uh, inside of a PRC. And so this is going to require oxygen and it's going to require water. So if we send blocks of charcoal, for example, in here, we get hydrogen as a byproduct, but we also get ourselves some uh, some sulfur dust in which we're going to need quite a bit of this. So let's go ahead and start with this first. Now, all of these machines are going to need to be individually configured. Um, so in this case, we are going to be from the back, we're going to be sending it uh, the items and so under the item section we need to make sure that the back is going to be the input uh, Now later on of course we also need to pull the ingredients out of here And that's probably where I'm going to use another quantum entangle porter Except this time it's going to be for items because this can also route items around However, I don't think it has a buffer. I, I could be wrong uh, But I have never actually used it for items even though it should be able to handle it now, in this case, uh, we're basically going to be sending coal blocks for now. Um, and if we need to later on set up a uh, like charcoal farm, then we can definitely do that. We'll we'll figure out what we're going to need once we get this going. But for right now, coal blocks we already are producing. And so this should start sending coal blocks to this. Um, and then we also need a fluid pipe because this also needs to be sent some water. So that's pretty simple because the water is already here. And then another useful thing is we already have oxygen right here, so might as well send the oxygen to this. Um, so over on the gases, we can make sure that this is accepting on the input. And uh, we can go ahead and tell this, hey, we need to take some gases, and I want to output the gases, and we can go ahead and auto-eject. And so there's the oxygen, and it's now heading over here. And then all we have to do is just simply link our new card, and now we should be producing sulfur. That's pretty straightforward. Now, some of these machines are going to output a byproduct. Uh, for example, this one produces hydrogen as a byproduct of this operation. And so one way that I can hopefully fix this is by simply putting a tank here and the tank allows me to dump excess. And so with this going here, I can go ahead and take the, uh, the hydrogen, the gas that it is producing over here and I'm going to send it to the face and make sure it is the output on the blue. And there we go. So now the hydrogen has built in here. And what I can do with this later on is just hook up to another quantum entangle porter for the hydrogen. And uh, we can utilize some of that extra hydrogen back into the system. So of course, let's try out the item channel system. So right here we have the sulfur. Now this is where I'm gonna find out if it has some sort of buffer. So I'm gonna go ahead and output to the top and you do see it goes in there and it does have a buffer. And I wonder how large the buffer is inside of the quantum entangle porter, because I honestly have no idea. So my idea around this is to make this sort of module, module, Mod modular. Uh, so that way I can expand up vertically on this same system. So uh, if this is not producing enough, what we can do is we can just add more of them going vertically and that should be able to uh, increase the output. Now, the next step in the process is, well, I need to make that uh, sulfur into sulfur dioxide. And uh, to do that, we need to oxidize it. So we're going to be sending it into a chemical oxidizer. And this process is actually quite simple. We just send an item into this machine and we can send it into the side and it's going to output a byproduct. So, of course, with this receiving an output, this is going to get itself a new channel. 
And uh, then we're just going to basically accept this. And I believe it is a gas by default. Yes. Um, so we should just be able to take this machine and make sure that it is outputting the gas automatically. And as you can see, it's automatically going in there. Really no configuration needed in this case. Then the next step, sulfur trioxide, which is going to require a chemical infuser with oxygen on the left side. And then we can put that new sulfur dioxide on the right side. Now, instead of actually using the left and right side, we could go ahead and say, hey, uh, since we're already producing one of the ingredients needed for the chemical infuser here, might as well just go ahead and output that to the side. So we can set this to auto output, turn that on, and that should send that sulfur uh, dioxide over here. And then in the back, we just need to simply send the oxygen. And then we can just have our new output set to the right side. Um, so we can go ahead on the back here. And we'll make sure to select our oxygen channel. And set. And then we'll just go underneath the gases and we'll say output to the back automatically. Usually I like to clear these just to make sure. But what we should end up is uh, on the back... We're going to have to configure this too. Uh, we need the back to be an out or an input. And uh, hopefully that will configure input two, maybe. It should accept the oxygen. <laughs> I hope. So I found out my problem. I just needed to go ahead and get this upgraded because it wasn't producing enough oxygen, oxygen to be able to support this. So now the oxygen is going and that configuration worked just fine. It really doesn't matter what side it's on. And now it's producing sulfur trioxide which is going to be what we put over here. I just want to make sure that I don't have anything auto outputting to the right. Auto eject is on. I just don't have it set up yet. So perfect. So now we can generate a new channel that is going to be producing the sulfur trioxide only to be used to make the sulfur uh, sulfuric acid here momentarily. With the auto output set and the channel selected, we now have sulfur trioxide building up in this buffer tank. Now for this next part to be able to actually produce the sulfuric acid, we're going to need water vapor. So I went ahead and set up a water channel that is now accepting water into its buffer. And we're going to use that over here inside of a rotary condensator, right? And then we're going to send all of this to a chemical infuser. It's pretty straightforward, at least as far as I think. Um, but if this is confusing in any part, of course, be sure to go back and rewatch. Uh, as I'm trying to simplify this process instead of just putting it all in the floor and making it super hard to understand. Kind of working through step by step. So right here, we'll set this up and make sure to select our water channel. And so if I find it in here, water, set, and then we'll make sure under the fluids tab that we're outputting and automatically outputting to this side. So we should have this, I believe though, we have to switch this to rotary condensator mode, which is going to condense the water into vapor. Um, and so after that, it's going to send, get sent over here into the quantum entangle porter. And this is going to be just called water vapor. Perfect. And that will be the new channel that this machine should send this output to so long as we take that and send it over here. And I believe this will now be a gas. And so it should automatically output over here, but just to make sure, we'll set it to output, auto eject on, and uh, that should send water vapor to here. And of course, after giving it power, you can see the water vapor is now building up, just like I want. Now, just so I can make this stackable, I am putting these on the back here. So this is gonna be the water vapor, and I'm making this this way, that way I can stack these vertically if I need more of these. And if I put anything on the top, it's going to sort of block that. So water vapor channel, we'll set that and make sure that this gas is outputting to the back automatically. And we don't want to accidentally send it to any of the other machines, uh, but that should automatically send to the back. We, however, are going to have to make sure that we're inputting and this is also not set up correctly. So we're going to have to make sure the secondary input well it looks like the secondary already made its mind up we're gonna make the secondary pull from the right and make sure the primary is pulling from the back i guess uh, and then we need to set this one up to make sure that this gas is of course depositing to the right auto eject on and there we go now we have sulfur trioxide and water vapor all producing sulfuric acid which ultimately is going to go into yet again you guessed it, another quantum entangle porter. And now that we have sulfuric acid, we have one of the three steps set up and ready and automated already. Now, the next step in the process is actually not too difficult. 
we need to make yellow cake uranium and turn that into uranium oxide. And anything that's an oxide, well, that's something that goes in a chemical oxidizer, as we just talked about earlier. But the uranium oxide, this is just uranium ingots that goes inside of a enrichment chamber and produces yellow cake uranium that then gets turned into the uranium oxide. So this is only a two machine process. And so yet again, this is just an item going in and it's being turned into a product and then that just gets automatically outputted into the entangle porter. And like this is just kind of like a pipe, right? And then so this will make it super stackable. And then we need to take this item and send it into the chemical oxidizer. Well, that's pretty straightforward, right? So all we have to do is make sure this has an auto output under the items. We'll go ahead and clear that. And we'll make sure the input, of course, is still here. Auto eject and make sure that just ejects it over here. I think that doesn't get any simpler than that. And this is going to be producing uranium oxide in which, well, we need to put into another quantum entangle porter. So we have now completed step two, and it's time to move on to the final part. And uh, this is going to basically require us to do two major steps leading into one. We need to take that hydrofluoric or take that sulfuric acid that we got, combine it with a little bit of fluorite in order to produce uh, this material right here, the hydrofluoric acid. It looks like it's best to, by the way, do it in bulk with a block of fluorite. Uh, that way it makes it for one, I think, faster, so long as the processing speed is the same. Uh, and then we're going to be producing hydrofluoric acid. And then we also need to take that uranium oxide that we had, and we need to combine that with the hydrofluoric acid to produce the uranium hexafluoride. All of these done in chemical infusers that we've already used. Uh, and then the last step is just to take that product, the uranium hexafluoride, and then combine that into fizzle fuel. So just so I don't miss anything, of course, I have the sulfuric acid now sending over here, and this is producing the hydrofluoric acid. That is then going to get sent in this machine. Of course, that's going to get sent over here, but uh, for right now, we'll go ahead and say, hey, send the gases automatically once we have this defined as the channel. And there we go. Hydrofluoric acid going just like that and is now storing up, and I'm using the block form, and it does seem to be going at a nice pace. Uh, and so eventually if these buffers fill up, these machines will all stop. But once we get to this step, it's not going to, it's not going to stop. It's going to be just fine. So back here, let's go ahead and, and just get this defined because this needs to automatically output the gas. And so we'll just have the gas sent automatically to the right side. Make sure that's auto input. There we go. And, uh, this should send automatically the hydrofluoric acid. Uh, so long as we have our gas inputs selected. Uh, so as you can see there, and then the back will make the secondary, and that's where we're going to provide it with our other quantum entangle porter from our other setup. So this is the point where we're going to combine our yellow uranium oxide. So uranium oxide channel, make sure that's selected. And then the gases, we are just going to make sure that we are sending to the back with an output automatically. And that should get it going. And it's now running. Perfect. And it's producing uranium hexafluoride. Now we need to put that into another quantum entangle porter. And then make sure that this is actually sending this as an output to this. And then the last step combining all of these things together, we should just be able to send the uranium hexafluoride into the isotropic centrifuge by simply saying, hey, input into this side and then over here making sure that the gases tab is set to automatically output and now we're producing fizzle fuel all of that to well be put into yet another quantum entangle porter now i don't know about you guys but this is a work of art i love this and the fact that it's infinitely scalable of course we're just taking it up vertically by adding more machines for anything that becomes a bottleneck is amazing of course, these cables are in the way, but we can just move them. But yeah, everything is completely scalable. So as many reactors as we want, so long as we have enough of those three basic components that I mentioned at the start. So now for the fun part. That's right, building the actual fission reactor that we're going to use this fizzle fuel in. Uh, and now I've gone ahead and prepped up some stuff. So we do have some reactor casings. And I think I'm going to build this 11 by 11 by 11. Um, so it's going to be 11 this way and 11 this way. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And I've built this in a multitude of different sizes. Of course, the max size I think is like 18 by 18 by 18, which is like quite large. 
And I don't even know if you really need it that big, uh, because you're going to be limited by how much fizzle fuel you can put into it anyways. And the fact that we're going to be having this one water cooled uh, is also going to limit the amount that we can put inside anyways. Uh, so we'll see how this goes. This might be big enough. And uh, we'll see if uh, if this doesn't seem like it's producing enough uh, material or waste, then what we can do is we can always build another one maybe over here and then end up putting the SPS somewhere else, which is ultimately what's going to make the antimatter. Now, this thing is going to be pretty expensive building it at this size, uh, but we should have plenty of resources to do it. What I'm going to have is these uh, these fuel assemblies. They're going to go this way and basically cover the floor in this grid like pattern. And I think I did the math right. I think there's 41 of these per level. Um, and so you're going to need like over almost 300 of these just to uh, satisfy this. Not to mention how much reactor glass you're going to need if you're going to use glass on the walls. It's like over 400 uh, glass, like close to 500 glass, I do believe, um, which is quite a bit. Thankfully, though, I think we can. Uh, yeah, we can. Once we get these placed in. We can actually use our diamond wand in order to, uh, to place these all. Oh man, once I get that first layer in. So when just like that, it's all placed. And now we get to simply place these in, leaving a one gap space. And it looks like, oh, I was very close, very close to having just enough. Uh, so let's do fuel rod assemblies. Oh, I actually did have enough. I just didn't have them all in my inventory. Look at that. I think I did the math right. Two, three. Oh man, I did. It was perfect. I crafted the exact amount needed. Okay. Uh, so, and I should also be correct too here with the control rod assemblies. And it just is a layer of these. I think we can put them in our offhand and do this. <laughs> that makes it so much easier to place in. And then I've got to get the reactor glass all placed in. And uh, this is where I said I, I crafted over 500 of them to support the like 90 some on needed. It was like close to 486, I think, was what we needed. Actually, I think it's it's a little less than that because we only needed four size, four sides, and I think I calculated for six sides. So it's, it's actually less than that. Now this machine is also going to need a place to send in the fizzle fuel. Um, so we might as well say, hey, let's send the fizzle fuel right here, and then we can output the waste in the back. Typically, that's where I like to do that. And then uh, back here, we can say we need to input water and output steam. Uh, now, with this particular reactor, oops, I'm putting the wrong things in. These are redstone ports. Um, the way I want to do this is actually to just input a ton of water and not actually use a turbine. Uh, the reason is, is because I believe that uh, we can actually get a high enough input of water in this pack, this particular pack alone, that we will not need the sustainability of the turbines. Now, we'll talk about here, that here in a second, but what we need to do is set our input here. This will be where our waste is outputted, and then this will be where our coolant is outputted. Uh, and so our coolant, we should be able to just trash it. I know we could generate power, but because of how much power we're actually generating, I find that to be very minuscule, us generating maybe a couple of hundred thousand RF per tick. Um, so with that being said, we can input water. Now, how are we going to do that? Well the sink uh, and the sink by itself doesn't do anything. But what we can do is I believe integrated dynamics is going to work in this. Had some people on our supporter server test this out and it works phenomenally from what it looks like. You can actually max out your variable card now and not all packs does this work. Um, but in this particular one, it should. And the way the integrated dynamics pipes works is you have an interface that goes, this is its storage. And then you have an exporter that's saying, I'm going to pull from that storage. So you place that there and then you connect it with a logic cable. Now, this is where the power comes into play. We just need it to export fluids, right? Normal export fluids, uh, export all fluids, uh, because we don't have a filter. This is just going to go up here, export all fluids. Now that should start to send water, but where it gets really powerful is under the properties. We can go to the fluid transfer rate and just set this to max out. So we'll do this right here. So that is going to be like 99 million. And I believe that is per tick. So notice how fast that went up. Yeah, that's the power of integrated dynamics without any of the configs being tinkered with. And then I do believe that we can use the uh, the steam that is going to come out of this 
we should be able to just simply trash it. And this should be able to support the transfer rate of that steam coming out. And it's just going to go into the trash. Now, I do have a way that I like to set up my reactor so that way it will never explode, ever. And to do that, it just requires these things, these logic adapters. Uh, and so typically, I like to place them in the back and uh, we can set up a couple of spots here inside of the reactor. So we'll have these set up and they're gonna be controlling every aspect of this. So we'll use four of them up here and then we'll use one of them to actually control the output of the machine and the turning on and off. So this right here has a couple of different things we can sense. We can sense temperature, waste, critical damage, and also the fuel. So what I wanna do is make sure each one of these are set up and selected. And then uh, we can go down and we can actually assign this. Now, the way these work is when one of these things happen, it sends a redstone signal. But by default, this is a little bit odd. Activate the reactor when powered and then deactivate when unpowered. So that's what we want set up. But at the moment, the reactor won't be on because none of it, does, it has to have a signal first, which means that this has to be inverted in order for it to work. So we need a redstone signal constantly being sent to the reactor. And uh, in order for it to be deactivated, we have to have an inversion happen. And I think the easiest way to set this up is by using the uh, create wireless redstone. And that's going to be in the form of these redstone links. Yes, these are the things that make it all possible. Um, so this will allow me to have the get the redstone signal from these. And then we're going to need to set up an inversion. Usually that's a redstone signal, like a redstone torch. Uh, I don't think there's any like smaller mod in here or anything that does a redstone signal inversion. I might have to die, do a little bit of digging. Yeah, this will this will be super simple. We'll just have a block right here. And then that should send a signal and it says status is powered, which would technically activate the reactor. Currently, there's no fuel in here, so nothing's going to happen. Um, but what we need to do is we need to say, hey, this isn't working. You can see right here, this I believe is there's no fuel. So because there's no fuel, this is sending an output signal. What I'm going to do is actually set all of these to a specific signal. So later on, if we want to use this for anything else, we won't have to worry about it. But that means if we put a link on top of this or on the side or wherever, this should invert the signal once we have this set. And it is not. Does that mean it has to be on the back? Or does this just not work that way? This is the, the weird redstone interactions that I deal with all the time. Oh, this has, to, this has to be on receive. So we just need to set this to receive mode. To do that, we need the create wrench. And then we just right click this and that's set to receive. And as you can see, that did shut it off. So that, that was correct uh, because this is running. And this should prevent this reactor from ever experiencing an explosion or reactive event. Oh, and it's not hard to do. So do not, I repeat, do not blow up your base because it's super preventable. Now, of course we have it set up, but I can't turn it on just yet because next episode, we are gonna have to set up the HDPE sheets because we need to make ourselves a solar neutron activator. The HDPE sheets, sorry, got it backwards. This thing right here is something that we're gonna need a couple of, I do believe, uh, throughout the end which means we need to set up the HDPE uh, sheets, which is normally a process that I would have set up uh, early on because we would have made ourselves a gas burning generator. But that is something that we're gonna set up here soon anyways. We have to produce ethylene and all that craziness, which we could probably just put here in this because it's a very simple automation. But once we have all of that, we will have ourselves a reactor up and running and it's going to start producing a ton of waste for us. But guys, that's it for today's episode. I hope you learned something new and I hope you enjoyed today's episode and uh, maybe learned a different technique because I definitely learned a new technique when I decided to set this particular setup up. So uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. And I, again, I hope you guys learned something new. Of course, if you did click the subscribe button, if you haven't already, give this video a huge thumbs up. I cannot wait to get all of this stuff, stuff set up and start producing antimatter so we can start diving into other mods while we let all of that work. Now, of course, without further ado, I do want to thank the amazing supporter of today's video. And that huge thanks is going to go to Antbra14. Thank you so much for your amazing support, by the way. Over on the Discord, becoming a Discord premium member and supporting in one of the best ways possible. 
I hope I got that name right. And I do appreciate you. And of course, guys, if you're interested in joining the Discord, discord.gg forward slash chosen architect. Uh, if you haven't joined already, over 30,000 members now and counting. And I appreciate all of you guys who decide to join. It's an amazing community. I hang out there all the time in the voice chats. I'm not a uh, not normal, normal YouTuber. I do act, like to interact with you guys and I love to talk. So thank you guys so much. I will see you, of course, in the next episode. And as always, thanks for watching. Bye.